Welcome to my latest studio upgrade project brought to you by COVID. 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 This is an Arduino based transport controller. This is not the final unit. This is a test jig designed to get the bugs out of the firmware. I'm waiting for parts. It should take about a month because of the complications caused by the pandemic. I've owned a lot of DAW controllers in my day, and while I have noticed that some do have tape transport functions, they're perfectly fine. I don't know. They use these wimpy, insignificant buttons. And I wanted to harken back to halcyon days of the studers with those big honking buttons. buttons. So I decided to build my own. I'm not going to give a big demo now until the unit is finished, but basically it runs off USB power alone. The sweeping of the LEDs there is the boot up routine telling you it's ready. Thankfully, I got some help on this from a friend of mine, Darwin Gross, a brilliant programmer who speaks uh, C++ a lot more eloquently than I ever will. Basically, it's the set reset registers that control the behavior of the buttons and the LEDs independently. Basically, when it's a task, it generates key commands, just like my Macintosh keyboard would, but not as cool as this. Okay, let me give you a little context here. This is a rendering of my faceplate. I use a company called Front Panel Express basically because they're awesome. Uh, this is going to come out to be 7 by 2 inches, 1.5 millimeter thick black anodized brushed aluminum screen printed with artwork that I provide with all the holes CNC routed. 44 bucks for a one-off. They use their own CAD software. Um, it's pretty easy to use, uh, powerful, absolutely no bugs. And predictably for me, uh, by the time I hit the purchase button to the doorbell ringing with the delivery is 10 days. It's gonna mount into a chassis box. I use a company called LMB Heger. It's a women's owned company in Los Angeles. They have these great products called Omniboxes. Basically, the sides and tops and bottoms that you order separately, and they come in these one inch increments starting at two by two by two inches. And the one that I needed for this project came out to be 34 bucks with shipping. So let me give you a quick demo in Logic. We might have some focus issues. See, <laughs> see because I'm using an iPhone, um, you're going to have to deal. I'm sorry. Let's start off by putting it in play. You're going to see the transport move and the graphics reflecting that change. Stop. Let's go into record mode. There's going to be a delay because of pre-roll. Boom. We're recording. Stop. These last two buttons, the first one is a cycle function. Right? You know what this is. You define a region and it will loop there indefinitely. This is how you bounce, right? I use this function all the time. Play, it will loop in the amber section indefinitely. Stop, turn that off. And the last button here is reset to zero. Put in many terms, bar one, beat one. There you go, we're at rest. Now, let's look at the code real quick. I'm wondering if you can see that all right. I think you can. It deals with pin pairs. I have five functions, stop, play, record, cycle, and reset. And each function consumes two teensy pins. One for the digital pin input and one for the LED drive output. Both running independently, running from software that my friend Darwin provided. This is what I was referring to before. This is the array that holds the memory locations for the different variables. This records and assigns the active pins for LED and button functions independently. Basically, it stores the current button in a register and only updates if another button is pressed. It doesn't care if you press the same button twice. This is my setup loop. Uh, 
where the LED cycle uh, really clunky right now. I'm going to replace this with a for loop. I've got nothing but time. Once again, this is the uh, register for the updating and storing of the current button, which sends the execution through a truth table. Depending on which pin is selected, um, sends it to one of the five functions. Here's one of them, uh, the record function. Basically, all it's doing is generating key commands. Uh, like I said before, just like uh, if a Mac keyboard was attached. On this line, it's literally telling it to type the letter R, then a delay of 50 milliseconds, then release. In some of these, it types the letter. In some, I use the ASCII equivalent. I will update these to all to ASCII in time. Okay, let's go back to logic a second. Um, these are the key commands, the list in logic for each of its functions. I think I can scroll. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's all it's doing. It's generating these key commands. It could be easier. So let me quickly cover final assembly and then on to a demo. You're a cop, a flat foot, a bull, a dick, John Law. You're the fuzz, the heat, you're poison, you're trouble, you're bad news. Bad news, bad news, bad news. Bad news. Just a quick minute to show you how I handled the electrical connections to the perf board, how I routed the wires from it, how I had to mount the assembly to create clearance for the switches, which shows you why this had to be two inches tall, how I interfaced the USB connector to the side of the chassis, and the schematic, which couldn't be more simple uh, because I used double pull push buttons. I didn't have to worry about the pull down resistors to the digital inputs to the Tinsy. Okay, finally, I got all my parts in. And it's worth mentioning, one of the most significant parts were these adhesive rubber feet I got. Um, they're magic. I mean, they hold the thing down on a desktop like suction cups. The push buttons are NKK copies. I got them from Amazon, like 20 bucks for 20 of them. They're front loading, 24 by 18 millimeters on the business end. You can see the leads there, the vertically oriented ones are the normally open, normally closed, and common leads for the switch, and the horizontal ones are the anode and the cathode to the LED. Regarding the connections to the Tinksy board, for the common signals, such as ground and VCC, I use bus wires, and I'm focusing here on the wiring from the faceplate to the Tinksy board. The goal here is not to win a beauty contest. The goal here is to create service loops. So one, you can disassemble it, open it up for troubleshooting if need be, and you're not creating any undue stress on the joints mechanically. Don't dress your wires without service loops just because it looks cool. And here you can see the whole unit kind of sandwiched together with the wiring. Well, here it is, all buttoned up. It's all a matter of taste, I guess, but I think it turned out great. The graphics look great, the faceplate looks great. The buttons have a nice tactile feel to them. There's the access for the USB connector, you can actually see it in there. A little background information here. I set this up for my own needs, right, which is logic. It calls those unique key commands, right? If you wanted to build something like this, you could very easily substitute the ones I've used in the functions to fit the application if they are different. Also, uh, my original intention when I set this up was to duplicate the traditional functions found on a tape machine transport. So this would be fast forward and this would be rewind. And then it dawned on me, that's completely lame in a non-tape environment. You don't need it. You can move the mouse and the tape heads to any location you need instantaneously when you need them. So I replaced these functions with two that I use a lot. That would be the cycle on and off and start, which instantly moves the tape heads to the far left to the beginning of the session. 
With the unit all buttoned up, I can now give you a proper demo of the Logic Progo, otherwise known as the BHB Big Honkin' Buttons. Button, 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 button. Here we go. Okay, for the second demo, I've changed things up a little bit. Uh, I've arranged things so the Logic Pro Go is in the foreground, and right here on my computer is my Logic Session. This way the focal point won't change back and forth like it was before. That was obnoxious. So this is the session itself, and that filer line is the tape head location. We also have the MIDI counter and the tape counter in view. So let's start off by plugging in the Progo. There's the power-up cycle. And you'll notice when it first comes online, none of the button lights are on, regardless of the logic session. Keep in mind this operates like a Macintosh keyboard. It doesn't receive information from logic, so it can't update. But when you hit a button, logic then responds and everything's in sync. Let's hit play. There you go. You see the tape head moving. You see both counters advancing. Stop. Let's reset back to zero. So you're going to see the MIDI and the tape counter reset back to zero and the tape heads move to the far left. There you go. So let's uh, depress the cycle button and enable a cycle region. Boom. If I hit stop now, it will reset to the beginning of this region. If I hit play, it will cycle indefinitely within that amber region. Stop. Let's turn cycle off and record for a little bit. We're going to hear and see a pre-roll and then the bar on top will turn red. There we go. We're recording. So there it is. I would have loved to use the same button Studer did, but they're like four inches deep under the faceplate. It wasn't going to work. I'm happy with the way it turned out. If you'd like to see the code in detail, hit me up on Facebook. I'll set you up. Other than that, thank you so much for watching. Peace out.